Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Are you glad to be here today? Amen. Amen, I am too. Uh, my name is Kevin Draper, and for those of you that do not know, I'm your student pastor this year at Cleburne First Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, I'm happy to be here this morning. I'm excited about what God has to share with us. I would just ask that you would pray for me uh, as we go through our message this morning. Would you commit to that this morning? Amen. Amen. On the 11th of this month, many people celebrated Veterans Day. I had the special privilege of viewing a news clip from USA Today from which the following statements were taken. Veterans who gathered at Washington Nationals Mall reflected on their service, their sacrifices, and they remembered their friends and loved ones who lost their lives fighting for their country. Joseph Carr, a Vietnam War vet, reminisced about his fallen bunkmate, Lee Klickner, and said this of him, We suffered through the good times and the bad times together. The news clip closes with these words also from Vietnam War veteran Ann Devney. What can you say when you give yourself and your life over for your country? It means a lot for freedom. As Christians, as ambassadors of Christ, as ministers of his gospel, we too are called to give ourselves and our lives over for others and to serve not only in good times, but in hard times as well. And yet I ask this morning, what about our attitude in ministry, in service to God, or in church life? What is your attitude in ministry? The Apostle Paul, by his example in his letter to the Philippians, answers this question for us. What kind of attitude should we have in ministry, especially when we find ourselves in hard times because of the gospel? What are you so happy about? The title of our message this morning. At the time Paul was writing this letter, he had already suffered much for Christ. A detailed list of Paul's sufferings may be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Please go there with me this morning. Where are we going, saints? Amen. And when you have found it, please let me know by saying amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 23 through 28. Amen. Still here a few pages turning. Wait just a moment. We'll be all together. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. I'm reading from the New King James Version. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more, and labors more abundant, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequently, and deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeys often, and perils of waters, and perils of robbers, and perils of my own countrymen and perils of the Gentiles, and perils in the city, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things what come upon me daily, my deep concern is for all the churches. Talk about hard times, huh? I mean, how could anybody keep a positive attitude and all that. However, friends, it is in this context, after all these things have already occurred to Paul, who, by the way, when he's writing this letter, is now in Rome on house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier, that he begins to write the words to the saints in Philippi that we just read in our scripture reading this morning. And if you're not there already, please put some marker there. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 1. Please go with me to Philippians chapter 1. Amen? Amen? Today we will discover through Scripture how Paul was able to keep a Christian attitude and how we as Christians, as ministers of his gospel, of Christ's gospel, are able to do the same. Three attitudes. How many? Three attitudes we will discover that we are blessed to have, especially when we are suffering for Christ and his gospel. Are you ready? 
Amen. Are you excited to hear God's word this morning? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to open your word. I just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would come and would teach us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. In verse 3, we have our first attitude, thankfulness. And what was the reason for Paul's thankfulness? Paul was thankful to God whenever he remembered the saints in Philippi. Please turn with me to Psalm 97. Psalm 97 and verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. The psalmist said that we ought to give thanks whenever we remember God's holy name. Listen to the words of the Apostle John in chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believed in his what? His name. John tells us that those who receive Christ are given the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. I submit to you today that Paul, by his example, is indirectly showing us that we should give thanks when we remember those who have believed in the name of our Savior and God. Amen? You know, Thanksgiving has just passed. And what were you most thankful for? Many times we're thankful for our families, for the blessings that God has given to us, things like food, clothing, and shelter. And these are great reasons for us to be thankful, amen? But what I want you to notice is what the Bible is saying is that we can have a thankfulness that is not based on our circumstances, but rather on another person's circumstance, namely that they are in Christ. You can be thankful for the fact that others are in Christ through your ministry made possible by God. Does this make you happy in ministry? Is this something to be thankful for? Let's continue in Philippians with verse 4. Philippians chapter 1, picking up in verse 4. And we will find the second attitude Christians ought to have in ministry. Verse 4. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy. The second attitude is joy. But before we look at why it was that Paul was joyful, we need to first clarify what biblical joy is all about. Now please go with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse 11. Where are we going, saints? John 15, 11. Amen. Jesus here is speaking to his disciples in John chapter 15, Verse 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus wants his disciples to have his joy. What was Christ's joy? The answer to this question is found in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of God. Jesus was able to endure the cross because of the joy that was set before him. The cross itself was not joyful. It was not Christ's joy. Christ experienced a painful, agonizing death. It was Jesus's, it was what Jesus' death on the cross would mean for humanity that was the reason for his joy. 
Christ's death would secure the forgiveness of sins and salvation to all who would receive it. The salvation of souls, therefore, was Christ's joy. And this is the joy that he wants us to have. Does the salvation of others bring joy to my life? Now that we have a biblical definition of what joy is, what was the reason for Paul's joy? Let's go back to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we'll read verse 5. Amen? Yes. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 5. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul was joyful in hard times because of the fellowship he had in the gospel with the saints in Philippi. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me. In other words, fellowship with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Or how about Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12? Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We are able to be joyful in suffering for Christ when we have his joy and even more so when we realize, like Paul, that we are not alone in our trials for the gospel, but that other believers are going through similar trials with us. Are we thankful and joyful for the fellowship that we have with one another? Is this something to be happy about? Amen. Amen. Let us return once more to Philippians to see the third re attitude Christians are blessed to have, especially during hard times. Philippians chapter 1 and picking up in verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The attitude is confidence. And what was the reason for Paul's confidence? Paul was confident because he knew that Christ not only began the work of salvation in the life of the Philippians, but that he would see their salvation to completion. Go with me, please, to Psalm 65. Psalm 65 and verse 5. Psalm 65 and verse 5. The attitude is confidence. Verse 5 reads, by awesome deeds in righteousness, you will answer us, O God of our salvation, you who are the confidence of all the ends of the earth. The psalmist points out that God is our confidence, amen? amen. And he is to be, he, he is our salvation and he is to be our confidence. Now turn with me please to Psalm 118. Where are we going? Psalm 118 and verses 8, 9, and 14. Psalm 118 and verse 8, 9, and 14. Verse 8. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. Today, the scriptures make it clear that our confidence is not in princes. It is not in Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, or even Dr. Ben Carson. Our confidence is in God. Amen. World leaders cannot save us any more than Paul could save the Philippians. Paul recognized that it was Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith. As ministers of the gospel, we too need to know who the Savior is and who we are not. Amen? 
If we understand and believe this, we can have confidence in God in the midst of trial and in every season of our life. This is his work, and Christ will see it to completion both in you and in me and in those we minister to. Is your confidence in Christ this morning? I hope it is. If, our, if, it, if not, then we are in trouble, amen? The story that I would like to share with you now is one that you may be familiar with or heard before in history class. Uh, it's, the title is Cornelius Jewels. Once upon a time in the city of Rome lived a noble woman whose name was Cornelia. She lived more than 100 years before Jesus was born. Cornelia had two fine sons. The name of the older boy was Tiberius Gracchus. The younger boy's name was Caius Gracchus. Their father, whose name was also Tiberius Gracchus, was one of the leading men in Rome. When the boys were quite young, their father died. The father's death was a terrible blow to Cornelia, but she was brave as well as beautiful and cultured. In those days, the noble ladies of Rome wore beautiful dresses and expensive jewels. Cornelia was not as rich as many of the ladies she knew, but she was a sensible woman. She willingly went, out, went without jewels and expensive clothes. She would rather spend her money to educate her sons. She made up her mind that her sons should have the best education that Rome could give. She wanted them to become good and useful men. One bright morning, a fine lady friend came to visit Cornelia. She was beautifully dressed. She wore lovely pearls and flashing diamonds. Cornelia was simply dressed in a plain white robe with no rings or necklaces glittering on her fingers or about her neck. Cornelia's friend opened a wonderful little box of jewels that she had brought. She wanted to show them to Cornelia. She carefully picked up the first shining jewel and then another. She showed Cornelia their beautiful colors. She told her of their great value. There were diamonds and pearls and rubies and many other kinds of gems. They were indeed beautiful. At last, she looked up at Cornelia and said, Is it true, Cornelia, that you have no jewels? Is it true, as I have heard, that you are too poor to own them? Just then, Tiberius and Caius came in from school. No, I am not poor answered the fond mother as she drew her two boys to her side. Here are my jewels. They are worth more than all the expensive gems that you have shown me. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your treasure, saints? What are you so happy about? Cornelia's treasure was her son's. Paul's was people coming to know and trust Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Today we discovered from Scripture that if our treasure our happiness is the same as Christ and Paul's, then the promise is this. When we experience hard times for the sake of the gospel, we can be thankful when we remember those who are in Christ because of our ministry, joyful when we realize that we are not alone and are self-sacrificing for the gospel's sake, and confident and knowing that God will complete the work of salvation in those whom we labor for as well as ourselves. Amen? Amen? After hearing the Lord's message today, we must ask ourselves, have I counted the cost of discipleship? And what exactly is my attitude in ministry? If we haven't counted the cost, if our attitude is not right, we will find ourselves reaching the place where we quit what God has called us to do because it has become too costly for us. Maybe you, maybe you are already at that point today. Maybe you're thinking, I know that this message is true, but it's easier said than done. 
I have tried and tried again and again, and it's always the same thing, just a different day. So how is it possible for someone like you, for someone like me, when things don't go our way and we end up with a bad attitude? How? It's simple, really. Listen to Paul's closing remarks in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 4. You can uh, track this in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 19. Listen to the relationship uh, between Paul and the Philippians and the teaching that comes out of it. Verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in in every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the secret. I can do all this through Him, through Christ, who gives me strength. But listen to the last part. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now I have received, now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Friend, friends, Christ desires to meet your needs today, to meet my needs. He desires to give you and me his strength to gain the victories that we are seeking. And not only that, friends, but Christ desires to meet other people's needs through his glorious riches and his strength, but he wants to accomplish that through your ministry, through my ministry, through our ministry. Amen? Amen. Take some time today to reflect on your attitude in ministry and be open to what the Holy Spirit reveals to you and ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your heart anew today and to give you a heart like his. But before we close, I just want to uh, ask uh, next week, Pastor Austin is going to be preaching about the ministry of this church and looking at the first angel's message. And if hearing this message today, I ask that if you would like to commit to the ministry that Lord, the Lord has for you in this church, I ask that you would stand.